So let's look at some numbers just from the US perspective. 10% of the adult population in the US, that's about close to 9 million people are not insured, insured, right? They don't have any health insurance, which means that just going to the doctor's office is almost out of question, unless you have money to pay out of your pocket. And another 28% of the working adults, those are, so in the US, the way it works is that you need to have a health insurance through your employer, typically, and 28% of those working adults are actually underinsured. Again, you have to think twice about going to the doctors. And even if you did go to the doctor's office, you have to think twice about spending money on your treatments. And all of this is going to affect adversely uh, the care that you can get. Even if you did choose to go, decide to go to a doctor, today you gotta to wait somewhere between 20 to 30 days to get access to be able to be in a doctor's visit and be see a doctor. Something I did not know until I got into the space, to tell you the truth, because my health insurance has been great so far, but that's the typical wait times that you have. And no wonder that people sort of don't go follow through the uh, health problems that they have and may end up waiting for a long time until the conditions worsen. And we see a lot more visits to the ER and urgent care over the last few years. And if you, if, if you maintain the status quo, and assuming that we have this shortage of 120,000 physicians um, by 2030, these numbers are only going to rise. So we got to do something different about this whole setup. So how does healthcare today start for most of us? It starts with using a search engine, right? We use our Google search engine, type our symptoms, check it out, and if it is something that is like, oh, I don't have to worry about it, stay back. Or if you're worried about it, you may go into the doctor's office. And even if you're worried about it, you probably don't have enough insurance and you stay, right? And that's 25 million queries on search engine. And there are about 1.4 million uh, visits to the doctor's office every day. And a large fraction of those visits are not probably visits because you have a health problem, probably because you're afraid when you saw the Google search engine, Google results. And then we don't know anything that happens between, for all those people in between, where whether it's actually, whether it's actually a problem with their, with their health or not, right? So you're kind of left here with this setup. So what we think is that we need to rethink how we are looking at it. It shouldn't be a funnel model. We shouldn't be thinking about how, how many people have health problems here and who should go into the doctor's office. Should they go into the doctor's office or not? It shouldn't be a problem. We shouldn't be even thinking about it this way. I think we need to rethink how this should happen. I think every, pay, every user, if they need to be at the doctor's office, they need to be there at the right time. I, th I think that's the most central part. Right? That's when we can truly say that we ha earth healthcare is a birthright. If you go with that vision, then it's not going to scale. We can't really replicate the number of doctors we have, and we can't be going to a doctor's office every time. So that's where the vision of how we want to do it happens. Okay. The diagram is messed up. But. So we have a, your own personal health agent, if you will, that works with you. And the doctor also has their own personal health, an agent that helps them in their tasks. And then there's a communication that happens between the two. And, and you still have access to your doctor, but you have it only when you really need to do it. Right? So building out these health agents that can work with you and can work with the doctors becomes central to how we can scale. And the rest of my talk will be about some of the challenges we have when you have to build such health agents. So the obvious place you can start is to say, I want to build these agents that are intelligent in some ways. Uh, they can capture data from the patients, from the doctors, and be able to make good decisions that allow you to meet the doctor at the right time. So to build such systems, if you're, there are many components that play a role. And to me, when you look at it from an artificial intelligence point of view, there are only two things that you should think about in the beginning. What data do I have, and what models should I build? Right? Now, let's look at some of the data sources that are available for us to even get started on this topic. The first one is that everyone should be familiar with is this notion of a medical terminologies or ontology data sets. The, the closest one to the task that we're thinking about is the SNOMED clinical terms. These are basically um, the, 
the set of all the tokens and vocabularies that you will use in a clinical setting. Right? Anytime you go to the doctor's office, there are a bunch of things that are recorded about you, and those are all fall into these clinical terms. And then there is a unified medical language system, UMLS, which is basically a compendium or a repository of all possible vocabularies that are there. And they allow you to bridge between two different vocabularies. So you could imagine having a biomedical literature that leads up to this mesh data set, and a technical term in mesh data set can be linked to a clinical repository or an instrument through this UMLS concept. So they form the base of all possible sort of uh, tokens that you need. And then there's an ICD-10 code, which is basically the classification of diseases uh, that are used. And uh, when a doctor writes down your diagnosis, he, he or she pulls out from this ICD-10. And if you're working on a billing or insurance, these are the codes that you'll see. And, and many papers that are related to diagnosis always try to predict these codes. And these codes are nothing but coming from ICD-10. So the other source of data is electronic access to medical research. So with the availability of PubMed and other sources, you can have now access to the best in or the recent research. This helps you to build an AI agent that are never ending learning, right? So you have your agent is actually uh, on top of what medical research happens. And everyone is familiar with your health sensor data from your, from your Apple Watch or any of these. Uh, things where you have a tremendous amount of data that we collect on a daily basis. And then the other one that I'm really excited about is the electronic health records. Uh, this is probably the large scale patient level clinical data that we have today, right, at a patient level. The way we look at this is all your encounters with your, with your healthcare system gets recorded in these records. So the way we want to look at this is through a uh, through this timeline. So a patient is not at a particular time point, but is actually a, um, some sort of a continuum of their health patterns. And what you get to see is uh, like tiny insights into that pattern. So for instance, here is, a, here is a, the, uh, the x-axis or the line is your, your time. And then at any point in time you had an encounter with the health system, you have these vertical bars. One could be that you visited a doctor and they wrote a clinical note, or another time could be that you had a prescription refill for which you need to go to the doctor's office, and that becomes another time point. So now think about this data set for every patient. Right? When you have this data, and you can train models, you can think about what treatment works for this patient. It's a good question to ask, and you can leverage the electronic health records because you can look at other patients who may have, um, who may have had similar conditions leading up to the treatment. Right? Or it could be, what is your prognosis for a disease? Could be something you can learn from this data as well, because you can, again, compare it to other people uh, on their health patterns as well. Now, if you take this EHR data, or a patient record, and intersperse this with the data that you're getting from your, um, from your health sensor data, then you have a full set of everything about you. Right? So instead of, instead of like these discrete events, you can actually have a complete timeline of your electronic health rec your record that can, be, that can be used for many purposes uh, to understand your health profiles. The new kinds of data that's emerging is the uh, user-doctor conversational data. With a lot more things happening on, on the web through email or through a messaging service, you start to have a lot more interac interaction data that are recorded. Uh, between a doctor and a patient. This could be a voice conversation that can be transcribed later, or this could be something that you actually are typing in. Right? And along with it, you share a lot of uh, information, such as your photos, if you have a dermatological problem, or even your video recording of your walk posture, because your gait has changed a little bit, and you want, you're wondering why that has happened. So that takes us to the second part. So this is a good glimpse of the data sources that are available for us to train models. But then now you have to talk about models. So I'm going to start with um, oh, building a medically aware dialogue system. I will not be going into the details of how to build a dialogue system, but rather I'll give you key challenges that we should think about. Right? It, should, it is not about, let's take this data set here of conversational data and build a dialogue system. That is not going to really work. They're not going to work because you're not, there's going to be a data sparsity that you would hit soon, because not every condition, not every problem is going to be recorded in these conversations. So to build a truly medically aware dialogue system, there are many challenges, and I'm going to highlight a few. First is, um, 
so the high level bit here is that you have a user and a patient, uh, sorry, and an agent, and you're trying to elicit and provide information to this agent uh, through this to the patient. And you want this to be medically aware. So it has a knowledge, it has a medical knowledge, it has some knows about diagnosis, it, right? So there's a bunch of things. Let's walk through uh, some of these. So I'm going to take an example conversation between a, doc, a, a real user and a patient and, I'm, uh, uh, and a doctor and sort of walk you through challenges when you want to build this as an as a AI system or an agent. Right? First is the user comes and says, right now my hurt, stomach hurts, right? which is not a terminology in a medical concept. It should be something that you map to an abdominal pain. Uh, in a snowman, right? Or it feels like I need to do a clean out. A clean out, there's no term here, right? It's, a, it's actually a bowel movement that a doctor understands, but it's not something that's technical term. And understanding that this is actually about constipation is something that an uh, AI system should learn to identify. And not, it cannot be a simple lookup. So understanding patient language and projecting them into uh, terminologies that are used in clinical sense becomes very important. Then the next one is eliciting medically relevant information. Right? So when, you, when the patient said they have a stomach problem and they're, they're constipated, you need to ask, when was your last bowel movement? Which is a simple question, because it needs to tell you the, the time it takes. And then also talk about other, other things. How was that bowel movement and so on? But then it doesn't stop there, right? Because you're the prop, you may be constipated, and it could be just your diagnosis could be constipation, it could be a severe form such as fecal infection, or it could be gastroenteritis, it could be so many other health problems that are related to this. And and to do to be able to rule out all of these and collect enough information, this agent has to be asking other related questions such as nausea and vomiting. If you had a nausea or vomiting, you're very likely to have gastroenteritis. Um, or if you had an in, or it could be a diarrhea leading up to because you ate food outside, right? Again, a food poisoning could be another reason for all of this. So to rule out many possibilities and look at what is the right set, what is the possible diagnosis for this one, the, the agent needs to know the signs of diagnosis and be able to elicit all this information from the patient before actually making a decision of what should be the next step for the patient. So, so now I'm going to spend some time just talking about AI for medical diagnosis, but you would ask, is this a problem only if you're building a conversational agent? And the answer is no. In fact, doctors can benefit a lot from having an assistant for medical diagnosis, okay? Because if you look at your time scale, remember we took 30 days to get an appointment with your doctor, and you spend only 15 minutes with the doctor, where you've got to tell everything you need to know, tell them, and they have to elicit a lot of information, figure out possible diagnosis for you, suggest the next steps. That's a lot of things to be done in 15 minutes. And, and the doctors can't even personalize uh, the recommendations for you. And in a recent study, it has been shown that um, the accuracy of a diagnosis of a doctor is about something like somewhere 60 to 70%, give or take. And it only increases uh, to 90% if you had multiple doctors suggesting a diagnosis. Okay, so, and, uh, and the reason for this is that doctors rely on two, one, two cues. First is recency bias, which is uh, how, how are the patients that are coming into my hospital with these complaints? What is their sort of diagnosis? And the next one is availability bias, which is what is the available information that they have in hand? They may not be eliciting more information because they don't have time. They'll just like, oh, this is not life-threatening. Let me give you some sort of a follow-up right now for you to work with. So just leading up to these two is, leads to a lot more di diagnosis inaccuracies. And it is not something new. It's something that's well known. In fact, uh, AI models for diagnosis was, goes back to all the way to 1970s. The first model that was built is called Mycene, uh, which is focused just on infectious diseases. The idea was that there will be an expert system. These are all models for expert systems. The idea is that there's an expert system which is basically a knowledge base and an inference engine. And a doctor can query this expert system to get more information okay, on possible differential diagnosis. And, there, and it's based on, it covers about 1,000 diseases and about 3,500 findings, and the findings that you'll see in SNOMED, for instance. And it's based on scientific research. 
So let me give you an example of what that knowledge base would look like. So here is an example for like a one particular disease called alcoholic hepatitis, right? So for each one of these symptoms, like the age or whether there was a recent history of alcohol ingestion, bunch of these, they give you two num numbers. Okay, and these numbers are expert curated based on scientific studies. One number tells you what is the propensity of this person to have this disease if they had the symptom. That one is telling you in a population um, how what fraction of the people will have this finding if they had this disease. Okay, and using these two numbers, you can calculate a function uh, that tells you what is the possible diagnosis for this particular patient. And there has been, as I was saying, there has been enough work on this. There has been many such diagnosis engine uh, that was built, uh, but the uptake was not that great because of scalability issues, right? Because you're generalizing these profiles, you really depend on, on your studies. So, for instance, an example of this, diabetes is very common in South Asian population, but that's a, that is something that was studied recently. So it's never made it into this expert system. So if I'm a South Asian and I go to this, to the, to, with some conditions that are similar to diabetes, then I'm not going to be recommended that because it's quite not very common in another population. It's not very easy to personalize either. Okay, so, but then the, the spirit of having a diagnosis model, the spirit of assisting doctors has always been there right from the 1970s. And a recent work with electronic health records, the examples that I showed you before, uh, there has been a bunch of work on uh, learning uh, models for diagnosis, right? Where it's easier to personalize, you can combine multiple data sources, and uh, there's no explicit encoding of, but the problem is that there's no explicit encoding of uh, expert knowledge. So you can take, if you had access to electronic health records, a large amount of them, then you can possibly train a model and use it. And there are other um, issues as well that I'll be happy to talk about later. So in a recent work, uh, what we did was we had this notion of how can you use these expert systems that are built for like 30 years of literature, like pooling together, and use that as a prior for learning good models for diagnosis so that you can deploy them, right? So the, the, basically the insight here is that if you can have a clinical simulator that can simulate a large number of cases from these expert systems, then that gives you a training data to train models on. Right, so we had a knowledge base, we have a clinical case simulator that simulates uh, cases, or when you say cases, it's basically a configuration of, of symptoms that lead up to that disease. Right, you can generate many such for each one of these, and then you get an example, uh, you get these uh, uh, clinical vignettes or cases. And then you can take these and train your machine learned model for diagnosis, right? You can pick your favorite one, and I'll be, um, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go over them, but you can build your own machine learning model. The nice thing about that is that um, if you look at top one accuracy, like oh, what is the top one uh, differential that you can get, just from an expert system, you're at like 75%, 70%. And if you're using a, a, a probabilistic inference, which is another technique that you don't train a model, you fix the parameters gov through the expert system, you know, the 80. But if you learn a deep neural net, um, you, you get a very high accuracy when you have not much noise, but it deteriorates. Um, uh, later, but then when you inject noise and you train, you get a much better um, models. So why is noise important? Because when you are building it in, to the user and not to the doctors, for instance, uh, users may choose not to say certain symptoms because they think it's not relevant. Right? They may be relevant, but you have your own biases. Oh, that symptom, I don't think that's relevant for this particular problem that I'm having. Right? You skip a lot of these. And so like, accounting for these noise that you may have and that you do not have a perfect system or input to the model becomes very important. And that's where, uh, and so the way we inject noise is basically very medically sound. We actually talk to a lot of doctors on what kinds of uh, noise makes sense, and then you can use that to train your model, injecting noises. Okay, so and then once you have these models, it's very also easy to incorporate uh, clinical cases from electronic health records. You could go back to your electronic health records if you have access to them and add more uh, clinical cases. And this helps you to increase the coverage of the diseases you may have. Uh, that's the number one thing. And the second thing is that it's going to also help you uh, with getting uh, different phenotypes. So same disease can have different phenotypic manifestations, which are like different configuration of the same same disease symptoms. And by having different data sources coming in, you have these different manifestations that can be used. 
So we also touched briefly on uh, multimodal inputs. So I'm going to like spend like a few si uh, just a few slides on this. So here's an example of um, multimodal inputs where the patient is actually giving you an image of their health problem. They have something in their toe, and they have this conversation. Now you can ask, how do I use both of this information? So. Um, even in a primary care setting, right, you, setting, um, a large number of people go for dermatological problems to the primary care. Like 30% of the dermat dermatological conditions are seen by a primary care physician who probably have not, who had taken like a semester probably of dermatology, really. So this is also another place where you can actually assist doctors as well. And it's actually a very long tail because you see a lot more people with eczema, and your data set is going to have a lot more people about eczema than flea bites, for instance. And um, within each class, there's a huge intra-class variability because your eczema on your hand is very different from that on your face, and so on. So we post this as a few short learning setup where the idea is that you want to learn generalizable uh, representations, uh, but you have only small amount of training data, right? So you have first, during your training, you have classes with many samples, but at test time, you're also given some classes, but you also have very small number of data, and you need to learn a classifier that can actually uh, learn to generalize. And what we showed in, in a recent work is that you can train a model called prototypical clustering networks, which is an extension. If you're familiar with prototypical networks, it's an extension to that, where every class has got multiple representations uh, for it. So you can see how eczema on your hand is very uh, as a different representation than I'm showing you the closest image uh, to that in the leg. So the acne is different, right? And then when you when you, at inference time, if you're given an image you can now look for the closest one in these clusters and then assign that. But when you want to do combined modalities, you could use that image as your starting point to get your set of initial diseases and then use that information later to actually uh, start asking questions, relevant questions for it. Okay, so the, how are we doing for time? Good, okay, cool. So the, so th that sort of conclude, that sort of tells you how we can think about these mo building models for diagnosis, right? You can imagine uh, getting data sources from different types, from either from an expert system or from electronic health records, and combining with data such as uh, these conversational data, so that you can actually learn a full space of uh, medical diagnosis really well. And to do that, you also need to solve other problems such as understanding patient languages and so on. So there are a bunch of open challenges here. One is the cost of error. Something that I've not talked about is um, what's the cost of error, right? How much, um, if you make a mistake, how much does it cost? Right? And how do we quantify that? And same thing with delayed, uh, delayed uh, treatments. So if you delay your um, treatment for a particular patient, how much is that going to cost? It's an important component and something that we should be thinking about as we start to think about um, machine learning into this mix. Then when you, uh, we touched on this before, like medically aware conversational models, where there's an the importance of eliciting information um, in a way that the patient will understand and also being able to communicate these outcomes, right? So that you know what the next steps are and how, and how do you bridge those. And the other part related to cost of is diagnosis in the wild. So if you look at ICD-10 codes, there are about, I don't know, quite a few thousands of diseases. You probably don't have data for all of them. And when you train models, we assume that your test set is going to have the same set of labels as your training set. And that is not the case at all in healthcare, right? In any, in any setting, like here, like you have a patient coming in with their symptoms, you, you can't always bucket them to one of those classes that you have data for, because they may have a different problem than what is there. So diagnosis in the wild will become super important. And how do you even learn a model? that tells you that, oh, I don't know how to actually find the diagnosis for you, right? And say, hey, this is something that I cannot solve for you, or this is something that I don't have much information about. You should definitely fall back to the doctor, right? So this notion of um, what's, it's, it's also a very active topic in machine learning. It's a notion of reducing agnostophobia, which is basically the fear of the unknowns. How do you understand, reduce the fear of the unknowns of things that you have? So you can tell, you, tell go back, the model can actually say, I don't know. It's a, it's a very active research, but it's actually a very important problem to solve, especially in healthcare setup. And modeling causation. So deep neural nets are machine learning problems generally today, except probably uh, causal inference, does not um, model causation at all. 
right? You have input, you have output. So you have input, you, you suggest a series of actions to take, right? Whether it's a classification or an oral framework. But truly modeling um, causation will become important. And as symptoms come in, to be able to say, hey, this could be projected because of the medication. So your nausea could be explained due to the medication that you're taking. So you explain, an, explain it away so that the propensity of you having gastroenteritis goes down, right? So being able to do those sign of causal models is going to be like super important. And I think that's also a, a place where we should be spending a lot of time as a community as well. Actually, that's all I have, uh, except that, so I truly believe that, you know, uh, everyone here has smartphone, like anywhere, even in a very rural area, in a, in, even in an undeveloped, underdeveloped countries. But we should have a care, or health care, to be also mobile first. It should start from your mobile phone. Right? And we need, and to do that, we need the AI and the human practitioners in the loop. So f for, use the AI when you can, and then project it back to the practitioners. And we should know when the AI system should also be capable of saying, I don't know, so that you can actually project it back to the human practitioners as needed, and have them all in the loop. And your cost, I don't know, I put in a number here of 20%, but ideally, the healthcare should be free. But you know, there has to be some sort of a metric on how you're measuring uh, whether you're making progress. I'm just going to touch because I have some, I have a lot of time probably. Went really fast. OK, so um, let me uh, tell you a little bit about Curai um, because I'm really excited about it. I've been here for like two years, pretty much from the start of the company, and I just love it. Uh, first is our mission is to scale the world's best healthcare to everyone. Right, so there's a lower barrier to entry. So anyone who needs access to healthcare should have access to healthcare. And I think that's where it is. And we have an awesome and a diverse team. And uh, diversity in terms of experiences, diversity in terms of ethnicity, gender, and so on. And we're combining uh, state-of-the-art ML with uh, product UX practices to build the best product we can. If, you're, if the space interests you, if any of this thing that I told you interests you, you should just definitely come and talk to me. Uh, thank you. It was a short one. Hopefully, you got something out of it. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much for working on this. Um, so can you talk about, essentially, some of the, you know, in the last two years you've worked at this company, like, what, what are some of the business wins that you guys have had? So. Um, so the way we are looking at this is uh, quite a bit of a long-term journey, as opposed to saying right from the first year, where is my business profit things. I think they will, that will come, but it's not something we're thinking about. But then that doesn't mean that we are a research lab either, right? I mean, so you're, you, you're looking at a long term. So one of the things we have done to evaluate how well our learning models do is to we had acquired this company called First Opinion. Uh, what they have been doing for three, four years is actually really a first opinion service where they have a, a large number of uh, doctors who actually can, ha to whom a user can go in, uh, uh, join, the, um, who can sign up and talk to the doctor for free of cost. And they've been collecting this data for over like three, four years, and that's a company that we acquired. And what we are trying to do is as we build out our models, we are also interfacing some of our models in front of the doctors to see whether the doctor will accept our suggestions and use that as our framework of thinking about how to develop the models better, right? So we don't want to go into the business yet in term, because we really think that the technology has to be really good because you're not trying to do something that's like, oh, I can just use the user's likes and you know, um, sort of reshare to figure out how well our model is doing. I mean, that doesn't work in this space. You really need to be precise. And so we have strategies on, on evaluating how well and metrics on how well we are improving and so on. But it's not something uh, we are actually, at, at this moment, doing anything. I mean, we have some thoughts. We have, we have been thinking, but we haven't done. I wouldn't say we have done anything in terms of economics to sort of say here are our wins. Thank you.